From out of the abyss and into your ear holes, it's time once again for the Mythwits, the show dedicated to all things geek pop culture, drenched in absurdity, and coated in sarcasm. Every week, we bring on an industry guest to talk about the ever-expanding Geekoverse. Ever-expanding Geekoverse, man, that is you, Ethan. We do our damnedest to be funny, but there are no guarantees. I'm your host, Peter Bryant, and joining me on this episode is my gravitationally challenged co-host, Mike Kafis. Oh, I'm expanding, all right. <laughs> Not in a good way. <laughs> on this episode, we're talking with astrophysicist Ethan Siegel. That's right. It's my pleasure to be here. And just a reminder to everyone at home, if your waist is expanding, you can't blame it on the universe. Right. Absolutely. Uh, Ethan? It, it, huh? I was going to say it's relative. It's relative to the amount of cookies I eat is what it's relative right. to. <laughs> All right. So Ethan is a theoretical astrophysicist, author, blogger, and full-time science communicator. He spent many years as a full-time physicist physics professor before devoting his career to sharing the story of all we know about the universe and how we know it with the general public. His books range from the origin of the universe to the real life science behind Star Trek's technologies and you can find him and his latest work at Starts With a Bang on Forbes, Medium, SoundCloud and all over the social medias. Ethan, welcome back. Man, it's my pleasure to be here, Peter and Mike. You guys keep it real on the Mythwits, and I am pleased to be back, and we are going to talk about all sorts of exciting things. All right, hold on, time out. Mike, are we seeing uh, the live video because I'm having a thing? Uh-oh, I am. I'm not seeing it, actually. God damn it. It says fucking... we're off air in the right corner of my screen. <sighs> this, yeah, this, no... thing, this thing is fucking killing me. This is killing me. So oh, wait a minute. No, 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 no. He, you're, we're on. We're on. Okay, no, right, we're on. Right. Oh. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, sorry. I, it, my preview, I'm not seeing it either. Facebook is being really weird. Being really it weird just popped up. I, okay. It just popped up. So pay okay. no attention right. to those cussings behind the curtain. No, no. All right, anyway. So, okay. Sorry. So we had a problem last week. It was really weird, but we're on track. Okay, fantastic. All right, so uh, so Ethan, you are, you are returning. You are back. You have a new book um, coming out soon. Uh, but I, do. I wrote a new book. Yes. <laughs> you want me to tell you about it? Yeah, yes. Sure, let's do that. We can start with that. Sure. Um, you know, one of the big questions that everyone always wants to know is where did it come from? Where did all of this come from? Where did the whole universe come from? And if you ask almost anyone, they'll be like, oh, I know. I was paying attention. It's the Big Bang. The universe came from the Big Bang. And if it were 40 years ago, if it were 1979, I would be like, right on. You nailed it. You're exactly in line with modern scientific thought. But the 80s and 90s and 2000s and 2010s happens and everyone's still like the Big Bang. And I'm like, what? Where have you been? We've been working on this. We've gone way beyond that. Where are you? And everyone is like, oh, he's being all speculative again. I'm like, no, no, we did all the things you're supposed to do with a scientific theory where we were like, hey, there are some puzzles with the Big Bang that we can't explain. What if we propose this new theory that could explain them? Hey, guess what? It would make these new predictions. Oh, look, well, we could go test these predictions. And we did. And what are the results? And holy crap, it looks like the Big Bang isn't everything and this new theory wins. And everyone's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, that's it. I need to write a book. So right. that's the book. Hey, yeah, you know, hey. and I've seen this. I've seen this online. I've seen articles about this and I'm like, Wait a minute. What? Like, like how? Yeah. No. <laughs> Ethan, what are you talking about? Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah tell us exactly. Tell us about right? this. So, what am I talking about? So, imagine right this universe starting bang and expanding and cooling, just like a good universe should do. Right. Well, we see that universe today because when we look back distant objects in the universe because the speed of light is finite because it only travels at light speed when we look farther and farther away we're actually looking back in time we're seeing the universe as it was younger and when we look back and see the universe as it was younger we find that it was three things it was smaller it was hotter and it was denser so that tells you, oh, yeah, that would make sense. I heard about the expanding universe. So today, the universe is bigger and sparser and cooler because it expands, and as it expands, it cools, right? The reason for that is wavelength, right? Light is a wave. It has a wavelength. Wavelength of a fixed length is a certain temperature. That wavelength gets longer, which it does as the universe stretches and expands. That means it's cooler. So that means in the past, when the universe hasn't expanded as much, it was hotter. 
it was hotter, it was denser, it was more uniform, and we see it evolving over time. So you say, great, well, let's go take this to its extreme conclusion, right? Let's go all the way down the slippery slope of the Big Bang. Let's go back before gravity has had time to pull things together into stars and galaxies, before it had these clumps of matter in it, when it was just like this uniform cloud of gas. So you say, okay, guess what? We look back in time. We look back at greater distances. We see galaxies that are younger and smaller and less evolved and less clumpy. And you can go back before there were any galaxies and you'll find a time where there weren't any stars and we hadn't yet formed them. And then you could go back even further and say, you know what? I bet you there was a time where it was hot enough, where that wavelength of light was small enough and short enough that you couldn't even form neutral atoms because bam, as soon as you formed one, one of these little particles of light would run into it and knock that electron off and ionize it. We see that too. So you say, okay, well, let's go infinitely far back. Let's go back to when everything was just a single point in space where you have an arbitrarily high density and arbitrarily high temperatures. And that is going to lead you to an idea that's been around for a long time called the Big Bang Singularity. Guess what? If the universe had a singular beginning, if the universe had that at the moment of the Big Bang, there should be a slew of observable signatures that we should be able to look for. One is, if we look, say, to the left, and we look to the right, 46 billion light years away to the limit of what we can see, we should see, oh, if the leftover temperature from the Big Bang is around 3 Kelvin today, and it is, then we should see to the left and to the right they should have slightly different temperatures by somewhere around a few Kelvin from each other. But they're not. Everywhere we look in space, the universe is the same exact temperature. You say, hmm, that's weird. You also say, okay, well, if the universe started off from this super hot, dense, expanding state, um, then how does the expansion rate change? Well, it can either, if there's too much gravity for the initial expansion rate, then the universe is gonna expand, reach a maximum size, turn around and recollapse and bam, big crunch, that's our fate. Or it could go the other way. You could say, oh yeah, it's gonna expand and gravity will try to pull it back together, but it won't work. Things will just expand, 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 and boom, they'll expand away forever. Or you could play Goldilocks and say, aha, Instead of too hot or too cold, the porridge is going to be just right. I'm going to sleep in the best bed. I'm going to, I'm going to wreck the whole house because everything is just right, just for me, Goldilocks, right? I know that's what you mean by mythwits. This is what we're talking about, big right. myths here. Right. Um, so what happens, right? You say, okay, I'm going to look at the universe. What is it, too hot, too cold, or Goldilocks? And the answer is not only is it Goldilocks, meaning this initial expansion rate and the amount of stuff in the universe have to balance, they have to balance to like 50 significant digits, which is to say this is like, this is like having a cosmic lottery where you're looking at the entire universe and you want me to pick the winning, um, you want me to pick like the winning cloud of gas in the universe. And I'm like, geez, man, that's, that's a tall order. And you're like, nah, it's fine. It's fine. That's, that's what I want you to do. Pick the winning cloud of gas. Pick the winning asteroid in the whole universe. Somehow the universe did that. It balanced that perfectly. But the big killer for me is we know we haven't observed everything there is to observe in the universe. And yet, if you come to this arbitrarily high temperature, you should produce all of these leftover high energy relics that should persist to the present day and we've looked for them and they're not here. So you take all of these puzzles and you say, well, the Big Bang looks really good, but then there are these questions we can't answer. What should we do about that? And if you're a physicist, you say, well, I'm not just going to give up and say, oh, it must have been born that way, whatever. No, <laughs> you're not going to do that. You're going to say, okay, what could have happened to set it up that way? What could have made it be born with those properties or those conditions? And the answer was hit upon in late 1979 by a young, at the time, scientist named Alan Guth, who said, you know what? What if the universe were expanding at an exponential rate so that you know how sequences go, that if I gave you numbers like two, four, six, eight, even Mike would tell me, oh yeah, the next one's 10. I know how this goes. And if I gave you numbers like two, four, eight, 16, 32, Mike would say, I know my powers are two, the next one's 64. 
might be a little more challenged, though, if I said, what do I mean by expanding even rapidly, more rapidly than that? And I gave you a pattern that went like 2, 4, 16, 256, 65,536. What I'm doing is I'm squaring the previous number. That's how I'm getting so big so fast because this is an exponential growth. Mm -hmm. What it means is in a tiny fraction of a second, I can take a tiny volume of space that's less than the size of a subatomic particle and expand it to be bigger than the observable universe is today. That's the idea of cosmic inflation. And you say, ah, that sounds nuts. And I'll say, yeah, I know. But when we work through the details, and this is part of what's in the book, you can not only explain why the universe is flat, why it's the same temperature everywhere, and why there are no leftover high-energy relics, but you can predict all sorts of new phenomena that are different than what an arbitrarily hot and dense Big Bang would predict. We've got six new predictions that we teased out of this, mostly in the 80s, and mostly in the 90s and 2000s, we made those observations. And guess what? We've tested four out of the six things that it predicts, all four of them, Agree with what inflation predicts. Uh, point of order. Uh, are you going on record as saying that you are a flat universer? Is that what I hear you saying? <laughs> yeah, I'm hearing oh, that, Oh, man. I had you a even flat universer? that possibility. You know, <laughs> it is. It is to within, you know, we can measure how departure from flat is the universe allowed to be? How non-spatially flat can it right. be? And right now, we were able to say, you know what? The universe, it might be curved like a sphere, or it might be curved negatively, which means it's like a saddle where it goes up in one dimension and down in the other oh, dimension. Oh, yeah. What, what are those um, called? That, that, that shape, like a Pringle. What is that called? That's a... Well, it's either a surface of negative curvature or a saddle. So, right, I don't right. know. Is there is there a fancier name for it? You want yeah, to give the, you the like way to, a, I'll, I'll I'll find it. I'll find it for you. It's a negatively curved hypersurface. How do you like that? Yes, I like that. That is it's that is, yeah yeah. So, Where I put the word hyper in there, it's got to sound scientific so better, now. Right? Yeah yeah yeah. Yeah, it's it's blowing it out of the water. <laughs> um, the thing is, just like if I said, "Hey, you, Mike, you, Peter, you, listener, go outside, go measure the curvature of the Earth, but confine yourself to your own backyard." right? Unlikely you're going to be able to do it. You need to be able to view more of the Earth in order to measure the Earth's curvature. Well, the part of the universe we can see is so flat that if we wanted to say, okay, well, I'm observing this tiny volume of the universe. If the universe is curved on a scale larger than what I can see, how, like, what's the minimum size of the volume of the universe? And the answer is it's somewhere around 10 million times the volume we can currently observe. So the universe might be curved, but damn, the part we can see sure does look really, really flat. Right. Yeah. It's a hyper hyperbolic paraboloid. That's the shape oh. of a Pringle or a, or a, hyper, a saddle, hyper basically. There. Yeah. 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 Why mess around with a non fancy sounding word like saddle when you could say a hyperbolic <laughs> paraboloid? Yeah. I like saddle. Hey, you're welcome. I'm, you're welcome. I'm a sim yeah, simple guy. Yeah. I like saddle. Education, everybody. <laughs> I learned that in watching a cooking show, believe it or not. She was she was trying to remake Pringles and she she's the one who looked it up. So anyway. <laughs> That's great. That's great. <laughs> I don't even like Pringles all that much. Whatever. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. Like so we're eating hyperbolic paraboloids here. I mean, I don't know. Right. I made cookies the other day. They all ran together. My wife wound up calling them crispy hexagons. I cooked a big batch of crispy oh, hexagons. Sweet. Ooh. Nice. Okay. It was, it was like it was like you could put figures on them, right? And like have battles with them. So, <laughs> all right. So, so we, we know. All right, so, we, so from what you're saying. The uh, <laughs> if, if you're correct, sir. Now, <laughs> what you're saying is that so no big bang, but but there was inflation, right? I mean, inflation did happen. Well, that's that's just it, right? So what you do is you can say, well, the big bang is a really good description of this early hot dense state, but there's a cutoff. You can't go all the way back to a singularity like some naive pumpkin head or something. You know, no, no, no. There's a cutoff, and before you can get back to that singularity. We say, you know, space was expanding at this rapid exponential rate. It wasn't full of matter and antimatter and radiation. It was full of energy inherent to space itself. And it's only when inflation came to an end 
13.8 billion years ago where we live that, ooh, what happens now? All of this energy that was bound up in the fabric of space itself gets converted into matter, antimatter, and radiation. But that means there's a cutoff in the maximum temperature that we reached. And some of the consequences, if you had a universe that didn't get arbitrarily hot but had a cutoff, is you would see when you looked in different directions, you would find, ooh, you know what? The differences in temperature and density that we see in different places, they shouldn't be as big as the average temperature itself, they should be factors of thousands smaller. And that's what we see. We see the densest regions or the least dense regions, they differ by only about one part in 30,000. You say, oh, well, if inflation stretched the universe flat, yeah, I should see a flat universe, but I should also see quantum fluctuations or density fluctuations or temperature fluctuations that are on the scales of being larger than the cosmic horizon and we see that we see those super horizon fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background you should see hey what types of fluctuations do i get you can say okay here's a couple of words for you that i actually do care about <laughs> um you could say you could say okay these fluctuations, they could have the same temperature everywhere. And that would be what we call isothermal for same temperature fluctuations. Or they could have the same entropy everywhere. And that's what we call adiabatic fluctuations. Some people call it isentropic, but that fallen out of uh -huh. favor. People use adiabatic. Um, hmm. And so you say, okay, well, guess what? We can measure what types of fluctuations we have in the universe. What we've been able to say is at least 98.3% of them are adiabatic and probably 0%, but no more than 1.7% are isocurvature. Guess what inflation predicts? 100% adiabatic, 0% isocurvature. So, you know, we have these intricate ways of putting the universe to the test and where we do test it and it comes back it says you know what this idea of a singularity in the big bang we don't have the observational evidence for it what we can say is here's what the final fraction of a second of inflation was like here's how it ended here's how the hot part of the big bang after the bang actually looked we still are trying to figure out what all the early consequences of that are. If you've heard of the multiverse, if you combine inflation with our rules of quantum physics, this is where the idea of a multiverse comes from. If you've heard of the idea of eternal inflation, which is to say, oh, inflation happens and here for us, poof, it ends. And here for someone else, poof, it ends. But these two regions have inflating space between them that drives them apart. This is where that idea comes from. So. It's a fascinating universe that's just a part of a larger multiverse based on the fact that we have this new theory that's been around for 40 years, so it's not really that new, but no one knows anything about it because no one's bothered to write the book called, I don't know, A Correct History of Time. All right. <laughs> All right. So, All right. Yeah. Uh I, I'm uh, I am one percent wrapping my head around this, but what what I I'd, I'd like to know is, and I, I I'm I'm afraid I'm going to get spanked for this because usually you end up yeah you know getting on me about this when I ask about it. Where does dark matter fit in in this new um, in this new model? No, no, no. That's a fine question. That's a fine question. So oh, yes. dark matter is still something that, you know, we are still trying to figure out. We don't know what right. it is. We know that it is, but we don't know what it is. So the ideas, the leading ideas are basically when the universe is hot and dense and full of matter and antimatter and radiation, um, it has to cool. And at some point early on, we had a slight, slight difference between matter and antimatter that led to the creation of more matter and less antimatter, so that when all the equal stuff annihilated away, you had a little bit of leftover matter. Well, we imagine that something like that happened for dark matter too. Either there were these heavy, unstable particles that decayed, and at some point 
it decayed away to something that was stable, and that leftover relic is dark matter. That's uh, that's the thermal freeze-out type of dark matter. It's also possible that the universe cooled, and just like we had uh, the symmetry breaking that gave mass to the universe with the Higgs and the electroweak force, there could be a different type of symmetry breaking that gave rise to a different type of particle that also has mass and makes up the dark matter. So we have lots of candidates for dark matter and they were all created all the candidates are created at some point in the early universe they had to be because when we look at those early baby pictures of the universe from when it's super super young before we formed stars or galaxies we see the evidence for dark matter in there but it's really the question of okay however dark matter was generated it was generated in the aftermath of the big bang hey Okay, so it wasn't there <clears throat> during that or before. Okay. All right. No, so that's a messed up thing, too, because in inflation, if you have things that are expanding exponentially, if they're expanding that quickly, that means anything that existed before the Big Bang automatically gets pushed away from one another. So we don't have any of that earlier stuff. If there was something before inflation left by time our universe has the Big Bang. Are we still saying that the universe is about like 13, 14 billion years, though, old? Or are we thinking yeah, that? Yeah, but, but the, that's since the hot Big Bang plus, you know, 10 to the minus 30 something seconds of inflation. There might have been much, much, much more inflation than that. We only have access in our observable universe because of how quickly inflation can take something and double it and double it and mm -hmm. double it in size. We only have access to that tiny last fraction of a second of inflation. But that means we have no way of knowing what happened before that. Did right. inflation just last a tiny fraction of a second and have a singularity before that? Did inflation exist for a long time and come from some pre-existing state that gave rise to inflation? Or was inflation something that was always happening, that was eternal to the past? We don't know. These are questions that are really good questions because not only don't we know, we don't know how to look at what's in our universe to find out the answer. So Oof. all we can do now is say, what are the other predictions of inflation and what can we observe to learn more about what inflation was like? How did it occur? How did it end? That's what we're trying to do now. But if you only read and consume popular media, you'll be like, oh, but this scientist says inflation was wrong, and this scientist doubts inflation, and yeah, there are a few of them. There's a famous one at Harvard, there's a famous one at Princeton, and being a doubting Thomas is very fashionable, but the overwhelming consensus of the field is like, no, like this happened, this obviously happened. We we did all the things you want for a scientific theory. We had an old scientific theory. We said, oh, look at all its successes and look at these puzzles it can't explain. And then we said, hey, but we came up with a new theory. It reproduces all these successes and it explains these unexplained puzzles and it made these new predictions that we went out and looked for and it turned out to be right. What more do you want? And people are like, I want more. And I'm like, well, you're an idiot. You don't need more. That's the answer. That's <laughs> always the answer. <laughs> can't even wrap our head around what we don't have what we do have, let alone what we don't have and need to know more about what we don't have. So, so, uh, so your book is, is about you know, how the universe was born. So what, what came before the Big Bang then? What, what, what was there beforehand? So, so what we can say is there was this inflating state, which is to say space was really different than what we know today. Um, let, me, let me try and explain it to you. You, you are really used to thinking of the Big Bang as a singularity because you go back and back and back and you're like, okay, perfect, bam, right here, this is the start. You can do that if something is expanding and cooling at a particular rate because you'll go back and bam, singularity. So if I said, hey, you remember that sequence, two, four, six, eight, ten? What's before two? It's zero. Zero is singularity. If I said, hey, you remember that last sequence I gave you, the one that described inflation, I said the one that goes 2 and then 2 squared is 4 and then 4 squared is 16 and so on like that. What if I go the other way? What if I take the square root of 2? 
That's root two. What if I take mm -hmm. the square root of that? You'll notice not only will I never get to zero, I'll never even get below one. Hmm. <laughs> That's why inflation is so interesting to me. That's one of the reasons is because you can't extrapolate back to a singularity. No matter how far back in time you go, things only get asymptotically closer and closer and closer together. And for those of you listening who are like trying to remember what's an asymptote, asymptotes are like your student loans. You make payments and you make payments, but you always still owe. You never get down to a balance of zero. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a, a mad, they're approaching zero, right? It's the, it's the, the arrow That's with right. the zero. It, it'll, re, it'll go towards it, but it'll never reach it, not even in an infinite amount of time. And that's the weird thing about inflation is no matter how far back in the past you go, you'll never reach a singular state. Mathematically, if you want a big, a big uh, phrase – to go with your hyperbolic paraboloid, uh, we call this, it is a past time-like incomplete space-time. Nice. Nice. Past so, Ethan, I, time I, have, I have a, all right, wow. so I had a thought about this. So whenever I think about, you know, like the Big Bang and, and people say, well, this is when it started, I always have an issue with that. And, and this, this is, I'm not a physicist, so my brain does the, you know, it tries to make sense of things. And it usually is wrong. But <laughs> my thinking was, you know, space time is interwoven. And the more space you have in a spot, so gravitational well, you know, black hole, whatever, uh, the, the more time slows down relative, right? Um, mm hmm yeah, so, this is this is how time works, right? You you have space time, and if you were stationary, like you and I roughly are, time passes at one second per second because we're not moving through space. But if you are moving through space, or if your space is strongly curved, then time runs differently. Time runs at right. a different rate. So I was thinking that you know, as you're as you're taking all of the matter and you're compressing it down, compressing it down into like this one spot, aren't you? Are you also doing that with time? Like, doesn't time become infinitely short? But is it? But it's all relative, so maybe not. So this is this is actually an interesting thing because you're sort of asking what I think you're sort of asking is, hey, what if you know? Forget about inflation for a minute. What if I were a particle in this hot big bang going back and back and back? What would I experience mm, as yep. time in this ultra hot, ultra dense, ultra expanding state? And the answer is you would experience a whole lot because if you take all the particles in the universe and you compress them into this tiny, tiny bit of space time, interactions go nuts, right? Things, things are colliding not at a few times per second or a few billion times a second, but like we're looking at like 10 to the 80 collisions per second between all these different particles. But nothing has mass yet everything is massless so everything is not really experiencing time that's the weird thing about being massless in the universe if i said okay uh, i understand how time works because i have mass which means right. i'm moving through space and time but what if i don't have mass right if i were a photon my existence would be instantaneous. I would find that I was emitted and came into existence at an instant. And then because I'm moving at the speed of light, all of my motion is through space. None of my motion is through time. The only thing I register is simultaneous. I was created and I was destroyed. I was created from an interaction. I was destroyed in an interaction. Oh, That's my the whole poor life photon story. Doesn't get to I live know. at all. Has no life whatsoever. But you and I are very special for that photon because by us observing that light, when we receive it, we can reconstruct its entire history from where it was emitted, what it was like when it was emitted, based on what we know about the physics of the universe and what we saw when we observed it. So from the photon's point of view, it didn't get to have a point of view. But from our point of view, we can tell you its whole life story about how it moved through the expanding universe, how it was created, and what happened when we observed it at that final critical moment. Wow. You know, Mike, the, the photon, it, it gives us everything, Mike. 
It gives up everything. It experiences nothing itself. It's selfless, the selfless photon. Yes. <laughs> and yes. you better think of that the next time you open your eyes and all those photons are coming in for it, you know? I would say, like, think about all those photons that never existed from their point of view. Your observing of them, that's the only chance they got to live. And what did you spend it on? You spent it watching the Mythwits. Right. You spent oh, it God. watching the Mythwits. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, These photons. So many Mike, wasted we're wasting, photons. Yeah, we're wasting photons <laughs> like crazy. <laughs> Uh, all right. Uh, oh God. All right. I'm. I'm just gonna. I'm. I'm putting my my dirty brain away for a minute, uh, and I'm gonna ask this question: Where, in relation to all this, at, when you start to get down that that um, compressed with uh, um, the the matter and energy and and the temperatures and everything else, where, and how close is the the quantum realm? The quantum. Th I don't want to say quantum realm because that sounds so marvelish but just quantum theory where is that is it is it closer is it is there any interwoven parts of of the quantum world or there are just quantum particles interacting at that point with the real world or within that compactness so so quantum quantum effects play a very important role during inflation um, which I think is what you're getting at and if it's not what you're getting at you could be like that didn't answer my question at all when we're oh, no, 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 no. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. That's what I was getting at because that um, sounds better than me not so, knowing. So no. we, most people, they think of quantum fluctuations as, oh, if I look down at space at a small enough scales, I'd see all these uncertain things because everything would be jittering around. Right. right. I would see like, oh, here's a particle and an antiparticle and they pop into existence and they live a really short time and then they annihilate away and pop out of existence. And I know at some level these particles are actually really waves because of this weird dual nature of quantum mechanics that everything's right. both a particle and a wave. And it has, although there are some properties it has that we know exactly, it has a bunch of properties that are inherently uncertain because of Heisenberg uncertainty. And then you say, okay, okay. So what happens during inflation? And the answer is if you try and visualize a particle-antiparticle pair popping into existence, space is expanding exponentially. So they would normally, if the universe weren't expanding, they would pop into existence, they'd exist for a little bit, and they'd annihilate away, and they'd go back into the vacuum where they belong. But during inflation, they pop into existence, and because space is expanding and then expanding, and expanding because of this exponential expansion, these particles can't find each other anymore to reannihilate away. So what happens is these quantum fluctuations that we create, they get stretched to larger and larger scales. They get stretched all across the expanding universe. And every time we have a new quantum fluctuation, it gets stretched but to slightly smaller scales than the previous quantum fluctuation got stretched to. Mm -hmm. So this is why we say, hey, you know what? This is another prediction of inflation. This is actually another two predictions of inflation. One of them is that these quantum fluctuations should produce density fluctuations where some parts of the universe are more dense or less dense than the average based on the spectrum of fluctuations and the spectrum of fluctuations should be slightly slightly bigger on large scales than it is on small scales because when inflation comes to an end its energy is a little bit lower so the smaller scales we see should have a slightly lower fluctuation scale, they should have a slightly lower magnitude than the fluctuations on larger scale. Guess what? We went out and looked for that in the data from the early 2000s from the satellite called WMAP. WMAP said, hey, there's a thing I can measure. It's called the scalar spectral index, which basically characterizes all these early fluctuations in the universe. What are they like? If they were scale invariant, We'd say, oh, that thing we're trying to measure, it should be equal to one. If they're slightly bigger on smaller scales, it should be slightly more than one. If it's slightly bigger on larger scales, it should be slightly less than one. Guess what? We measured it. It looks like that number that we said, oh, it could be one or a little more or a little less, looks like it's 0 0.97 which is exactly what inflation predicts. 
you can't predict that crap with the Big Bang without inflation. No one, no one knows how to predict that, except inflation predicted it years before we were able to make that measurement. It also predicts, guess what? Gravitational waves should do that too. There are people looking for that right now. If you remember, hey, wasn't there a big thing about Bicep 2 a few years ago where they were like, hey, we discovered these gravitational waves from inflation and they're huge, they're really big, they're way bigger than anyone expected. And then everyone is like, actually, you guys uh, didn't account for your dust correctly, and you used data that wasn't released, and you made a big mistake in doing this, and you didn't detect gravitational waves from inflation after all. They didn't detect gravitational waves from inflation after all. But they should be out there. We just don't know how big they are. That depends on the model of inflation. But if they are out there, we should be able to detect them, and we know what their spectrum should look like the only thing we don't know is their amplitude. Ooh, Did I answer your question, Mike? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> totes, <laughs> totes. Hey, uh, I'd like to take this second to ask anyone, anyone in the uh, chat room, please ask a question. <laughs> You know what's funny? Please, you know what's funny? We please. always get questions. We yeah. always get questions. No Nobody questions. Qu no questions with <laughs> no. you. That's real funny, man. You know what? Maybe maybe People we are... need to switch topics. Hey, you guys like cosplay? You know, I'm I'm planning. I've got my my new uh co costume for this Halloween planned out. P Peter, I know, has seen some of my costumes, so he knows what I'm all about with oh, that. Yeah. Um. This year's costume, I'm going to do a grown-up version of Deku from My Hero Academia. I know you guys, oh, I know, you guys know what that is. Actually, I kind of know what it is, but only, only because I'm doing a, I'm going to be releasing a, a, a trivia kick, a trivia game on Kickstarter for Geek Trivia, and I had to throw some anime in there. And I asked uh, one of my friends about, hey, what are the, what, what are the young folk watching on the anime these days? And uh, she schooled me on some of it, and I was like, okay, there we go. Hey, shout out to Spence, I know. I know uh, Daddy Spence is in the room. So, yeah, yes. she, she schooled me on a little bit. So, yeah, I am familiar. But, um, yes, and, and Ethan does unbelievably fantastic cosplay. You were were you, you WMAP one year? I was the James Webb Space Telescope last year. Oh, okay. I had the big I, oh, I had the nice. big gold mirrors. I had a big five layer sun shield. That was my favorite thing as I posted the pictures of it and uh, the James Webb Space Telescope account like the people who run it, they they were so excited. They were like, "He got all five layers. He got all five <laughs> layers on his costume." <laughs> oh my god. That's hey, awesome. all right, so real quick, uh, uh, you you had mentioned Star Trek Discovery. That, that you're a big fan of that, right? I, I guess I guess you're a big fan. You want to talk about it a little bit. So let, let's talk about it a little bit. I, I, I have mainlined about, I think, the first six or seven episodes. Because, you know, it's CBS All Access. And I was like, eh, but then when, you know, and I wanted to watch it. But then when you said that you had seen it and that you're, you know, you're into it, I was like, oh, all right, I'll break down. I bought it. Did, uh, did you and I've at watched least a bunch of them. get through the seventh episode? Because if you start at season one and you get through episode I would say the first six episodes. You, I was I've like, seen, I'm, seen all I'm on of the season fence. one. I've good, seen all of season good. one. Good. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll uh, we'll we'll hang out there. When you get to that time loop episode, um, that for me is just like the switch that went from like I'm not sure about this show to I'm sure about this show. Right. Mm, right. That yeah. Was... So, so with with Discovery, I was kind of like some of it was kind of like I'm like ah, it's kind of magic, you know? I mean, it's like I mean we're Really, I mean, they're pushing science, and they do a lot of really good science on this show. Uh, some of it was kind of like, that's eh, kind of magic talk. But then I was like, but you know what? You know what? If it's, you know, like the, I, I forget, I, I always get this quote wrong, so I'm not even going to try it. But, you know, the, something significantly technologically advanced is non is indistinguishable from magic. And I'm thinking, yeah, you know, Arthur Star C. Trek, Clark, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Star Trek yep. has done a lot of magic. Like, transporters are magic, right? I mean, they're not, they're kind of magic, right? Yeah, I, I don't really have a lot of uh, desire to be, you know, taken apart atom by atom, put back together atom by atom, and have any confidence that that thing that you put back together is actually me and not some clone of me that you murdered me and now there's my clone. Right. Right. Um, I don't... I don't want to get in that. If you're indistinguishable from your clone, or your clone is indistinguishable from you, and there's only one of you, what does it matter? I, I mean, I could talk about that. That yeah, whole, a whole philosophy, show. A whole show. philosophy but, all day. I love that. 
talk but about because yeah, who, I will say who this. cares what you experience all your only value is what the rest of the world thinks of you who cares about your you know inner you know, mind that makes you you right well I, if I you but this. if it wink, if it reassembles wink. you if it reassembles you hey, with the same mike, memories mike that's a whole show let's not it's not good in <laughs> we don't have time do we don't have time no, for it's, this discussion we, we it's really actually don't. It's actually 940, I know. Yeah. Yeah, so I just I'm want just, to say I'm that just... I, I, like the, the, I, I like Discovery. I really do. I, as a matter of fact, I like it more than I thought I would like it. It may, God damn it, it may be my favorite. It might be. If not, it's right up there. Holy shit. Yeah. That's, that's something right there coming from Peter. Yeah, yeah. No, I like that's... the characters. The writing is good. It's smart. It's, it's good. It's a good show. All right. I'll start checking it out. I've been holding off, but uh, I mean, I think it's... <laughs> And, right. and, and Ethan, you in? I, I mean, you you digging it? I will say, you know, for everyone, you have to remember that. And, and we've been through different incarnations of Star Trek. The Star Trek that is on TV now is not the same as the Next Generation or the original series or whatever Star Trek was your favorite Star Trek before Discovery, and it shouldn't be. Our ideas of what the future is going to be is very different than what we thought the future was going to be 50, right. 30, 25 years ago. Um, and so you have to be willing to say, okay, look, I'm entering a universe that I, it has elements that I'm familiar with, but it's also foreign to me and I have to be willing to accept this new thing for what it is because it's a new set of people, a new set of visions, but if it has that Star Trek spirit of humanity being good to one another, finding commonalities despite our superficial differences, working together um, for the good of all, like that's that for me is the spirit of Star Trek. If you have a show mm -hmm. that encapsulates those things, then you have a Star Trek show. Yeah, it's good. It's good. As a matter of fact, the, the, in season two, the stuff that happened with uh, Mr. Saru, the, the the guy with the things on the side of his head. Um, oh, the uh, I, gang. I, <laughs> yeah, I really like, you know, I originally I thought, oh, they made this character and he's all magic because he can sense this magical danger field or whatever the hell it was. But they didn't really go down that road. They they took a more relaxed, like that was, was kind of what was said, but the way they've played it out, it's more, he just, he just, he can pick up on, he can just pick up on these very observant of, of, of people's fear responses and stuff. Like it's not as magical. There, there's still a little bit, like sometimes it goes off and I'm kind of like, yeah, yeah, I would have clued him into that. I mean, that's a little magic-y. But other than that, they've been handling it pretty good and i like what they've done with it in season i've seen what's happened with the the that portion of him in season 2 so far you know and i won't spoil it for those who haven't but i i will encourage people who who see that and 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 maybe feel like you did for a little bit they're like ah i'm skeptical i don't i don't know if i would buy that how did you feel about counselor troy and all the yeah. beta zeds like oh i feel despair coming from the deck captain like really yes. feel despair <laughs> exactly. across across yes. interstellar space you feel despair right right like a thousand a thousand souls screaming out right. all at once now okay real quick okay, game because we what, actually we, we actually thing. have a question <laughs> we actually have a question from the chat room peter all right go all right uh spence wants to ask uh Big Daddy Spence wants to ask, rather. Uh, what is the current interpretation about the space-time waves being observed on the astrophysics theory concerning post-pre-Big Bang? Uh, Post-slash-pre-Big Bang. That's a big yeah. question. Uh, so, basically, when we say post-Big Bang, we're asking, okay, we have these signatures now that are in our observable universe. Where did they come from? So what inflation offers is saying, okay, let's not go back to a singularity. Let's go back to this cutoff where we have this inflationary phase. How does the inflationary phase generate these seeds, these quantum fluctuations that will imprint themselves on the universe? Then when inflation comes to an end, I think about this like, oh, I've got a ball and I'm rolling on top of this hill and there's a big cutoff to the hill, like it's a plateau and the ball's rolling slowly and we're inflating, we're inflating and boom, we roll down into the valley. And when we roll down into the valley, we go back and forth. That's all the energy from inflation getting converted into particles, into matter and antimatter and radiation. That's something we call 
cosmic reheating. We say, okay, the universe, when it didn't have any matter in it, it was cold because it was empty. All that energy was in space. It didn't have a temperature. It just had an amount of energy in space. Then inflation ends, that energy gets dumped into particles. So it reheats, it comes back up to this high temperature, but not arbitrarily high, not arbitrarily hot. So we can say, okay, how hot do we see the universe get? What are the maximum properties we can do? And what can we learn about the inflationary state based on that reconstruction? There are all sorts of people who, who work on exactly that question. This is, this is an important field of scientific inquiry that I don't want to gloss over with a two second answer. So the two second answer you get is, oh, that's a good question. So we talk about the fluctuations generated during inflation, which is before the Big Bang. We talk about reheating, which is the transition from the inflationary phase for us to the hot Big Bang. And then we have all the imprints on our universe post Big Bang. Okay. All right. Cool. Hey, uh, I gotta, I gotta move along quick. So, right. Astro, Astro Tours, Astro Tours, um, real quick. Come upcoming trip to Chile in Chile in November. Uh, just like one minute. What is, what is Astro Tours? Uh, so Astro Tours is a, uh, it's a company that's trying to merge astronomy, night skies, fantastic astronomical adventures with tourism. Saying like, hey. You like science, you like awesome scientists and science storytellers, and you like going to some of the best places for the best skies on Earth. Uh, I took a trip this past January to Iceland, and I led my first astro tour there, and it was really cool. We went northern lights hunting. We got to see a total lunar eclipse, and we got to we got to experience some good times together at, amidst the gorgeous like geological wonders of Iceland. So nice. it was a great time. Unfortunately for me, and for anyone who is interested in going to Chile, uh, we needed a certain number of signups by a certain date, and it didn't happen. So oh. that trip, that trip, kibosh. Thanks for thanks for offering me the plug. But I will say, Astro Tours is alive and well. They have a lot of trips coming up. I'm just not on any of the ones that are currently on the schedule. Oh, okay. But mm. I do encourage you, if you're interested in combining astronomy and tourism with luxury travel. Uh, that is the place to go. Okay. All right. All right. Very good. Uh, man, it, it sounds awesome. So, everybody, go to uh, – we're going to play a game, but go to uh, Forbes.com forward slash sites forward slash starts with a bang. Also, check out Ethan on SoundCloud. He has his own podcast, and you should check it out. Um, if, you, if you like this, you're going to love that because you don't have us idiots talking. You just have Ethan. Uh, and that is at SoundCloud.com forward slash Ethan dash Siegel dash 172073460. It's in our notes. It's in our show notes. Um, and use Google. Google use is your Google. friend. We're in the just, iTunes just store too. Yeah. Starts with a bang podcast. Right, right. And on Patreon, starts with a bang. All Damn. right, let's do this. Uh, here we, here we go. All right, everybody. It is game time with the Mythwits. I'll be your game master. And this week we are playing a Star Trek themed. Jep are nerdy. Wow. <laughs> the game. Oh, oh, <laughs> I'm no. like it's. F. Poor Mike. I can see Mike's eyes rolling around in his head. <laughs> the game uh, really... Let me tell you, is this the new Star Trek uh, trivia no. show? Oh, no. Okay. no. Well, uh, some. Some of it. All right, so the game where we mash up our favorite games into one. Four of our favorite games into one. There are four categories to choose from, each being one of our other games. In each category, there are four questions that increase in difficulty and value. Difficulty is arbitrary, and the game master is the arbiter. So in other words, I said that this was more difficult than the other one, and that's, that's a final word. Uh, on their turn, the contestant will choose a category, and the game master will give the next question in line. If they get the answer right, they get the points for that question, and we get to go again. So in other words, you get it right, you get to keep going until you get one wrong. If they get it wrong, we move on to the next ca contestant. Who will choose another, care another category? All right, so what I'm going to do... I am going to uh, share the game board with the with the folks at home. Share the scores. I gotta put that. Sorry. Whoops. Sorry, folks. All right. There's the scores. Uh, oh, why is it so weird? Oh my god. Okay. Well, the scores are off. I don't know. They were fine a few minutes ago. So uh, anyway. Um, we use my fingers. What the hell? No. Well, they're there. They're just they're cut off for it's... some odd reason. Okay. Uh, 
what are we gonna do? We're not gonna we're not gonna fix it. We're just gonna watch. We're just gonna play the game. All right. So, um, let me share my screen with you guys so that you can see. Uh, this is just for Ethan and Mike, so you can see. Oh, All right. So, yeah. yeah. There you go. Our categories are cheesies or species. Where you will tell me whether this is a cheese or a Star Trek species. Uh, who dat? You got to name the uh, Star Trek actor. I'm gonna give you the character. You got to tell me the actor. Uh, Soundbite mm. Madness, and these are all sounds from Star Trek, the original series. Uh, or Bet the Geek, which is just straight up Star Trek trivia. So, I'm, Mike, to give you a chance, I'm going to let you go first. Uh, I gotta want... Pick, you got to pick the one. It starts at one and you got to work your way down. Uh, okay. Uh, I'll take Soundbite Madness for uh, one. All right, Soundbite Madness for one. All right, Mike, here you go. Ready? Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm just supposed to tell you what that was. What was that sound? Captain Kirk having a bow. No, I'm just kidding. It was <laughs> it, it was a uh, uh, you know what we were just talking about with the, uh, the the beaming a beamer beams beam beaming beaming <laughs> transporter. Oh, got there you go. Ooh. Sorry. Good Hello, job, Mike. Hey, Mike. <laughs> yes. All right. There you go. go. All right. Sound bites for two. Yes. Sound bites for two. All right. Number two. Red alert! All right, that is correct. Don't worry, Ethan. You'll get the. No, take I'm over cheering him. for him. Good You'll job, Mike. Let me, Leah. This is like the guy who gets two in his pocket before he misses the next ball, and then you run the table. So, all right, so uh, Mike. <laughs> all right, uh, let's see. Um, uh, you know what, man? Let me just get three points uh, on the next. Let me get the uh, sound bites. All right, ready. Yeah. Communicator. That is correct. Good job, Mike. You're doing well. You're doing well. All right. Um, I'm I'm not gonna fall into your four point trap. So uh, I'm gonna go hoot out for one. I can't get rid of the. All right. So it broke. All right. So hoot out for one. Okay. Haikiru Sulu. Oh, like who's the real actor? Yeah. Right. Oh, see his face. It's a uh, hello there. Uh, 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 God darn it. Give me one second. Give me one second. Um, hands are here. I'm not looking anywhere. It's um, uh, uh, George Takai. Woo! Good job. All right. Oh. Okay. My I'm thing not... is broke. Why my thing broke? I don't know. Damn it. It's too much tech. <laughs> all right, Mike. I'm just going to have to remind you all. All right, yes, you got that one correct. I'm just going to have to. Yes. God damn it. This sucks. I hate when this stuff happens. All right. So we got those Do out. I, should I try and keep a score? No, I got it. No, it's not the score. Okay. I got all right. it. I got all right. It. All okay. right. So, Mike, what, what's next? Uh, who dad oh, for two? Sound by madness for four. I just feel, I feel it. I feel like there's a there's a name. I sh uh, Okay, I'm going to go with who dad for two. Who that for two? Captain Archer. Oh, Archer. Oh, um, Jonathan Archer. Damn it! I always forget his name. That's the. Uh, I cannot remember his. I always. Oh, yeah, Quantum Leap and all that good stuff. Um, shit, shit, shit. Yeah, I, 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 I. I let me. In the interest of time, I got. I got nothing. Incorrect. All right, Mike. That was. Well, I was uh, correct. I have nothing. That was Scott Bakula. All right, Ethan, you're up. Oh. Ethan. So cheesies or so species? Good. You know, let's do it. Let's see what's under cheesies or species. Okay. <laughs> First one. Borson. The Borson. Borson. Is it the Borson. That. Uh, Smash me in the head with a rock on that planet with the singing flowers, or was the Borson a tasty uh, thing that I put on my cheese? I mean, on you my know, on my cracker. I, I, I think I think I'm gonna go with the cheese over here. Hmm. That is correct, Ethan. Oh, correct. I do love a All delicious right. cheese. All right, cheeses are species for two. Who dat for three? Soundbite for four, or bet the geek for one? 
Let's do uh, Cheesies of Species number two. It worked out so good. Okay. Bolian. Ooh. Bolian sounds like a species. We're going to go with species here. That is correct. The Bolians are a humanoid with blue skin and small ridge running up from the back of their heads to their noses. All right. Uh, what would you like? Cheese of species? Who let's that, let's go for number three. Why wouldn't we keep with the cheesies? Okay. All right. Caseri. Cass Caseri. Okay, this is one I don't recognize, uh, so we're going to have to guess, which is music to you, Mike. Let's say Kasseri is a species. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh! It is a traditional Greek and Turkish cheese. <sighs> it's a good cheese, too. Really tasty. Ah! <laughs> Mike? Yes. All right. Um... Eh, I don't want that daggone uh, cheese. That's always a that's always a fifty fifty. Uh, what do <laughs> we have? Always uh, what's... a fifty fifty. All right, so you have who dat for three, soundbite madness let's, for four, or bet the geek for do one. Bet the geek for one. Bet the geek for one. All right. What no win scenario is a training exercise used in Starfleet? Kobayashi Maru. Damn! Look at you. You know, I, I am I am a Star Trek fan. You. No, I mean, you, you realize that, no, no, you? You, didn't, you didn't have to do the, oh, it's that thing with the... All right, anyway, all right so oh. Mike was... Oh, no, yeah, that's... Okay. That's what I meant, was you nailed it. You said, bam! Like, no thinking, that's, you just did it. Yeah, that's fair. That wasn't okay. buried in my subconscious somewhere. Let's do Bet the Geek for two. Bet the Geek for two. Okay, approximately every seven years, Vulcan males and females who are bonded to each other experience an overpowering mating drive known as... Ponfar. God damn! Look at you. I, I I just started watching. Um, I just started watching. What is that show? The um, that the parody show that uh, oh, oh Orville. Uh, the, the Orville and the, the first episode so was it first or second with them going to watch him pee? That was hysterical. Right. <laughs> all right. So anyway, Mike, all right. Uh, Let's go. Game. You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna do uh, soundbite madness for four. I'm now now I'm getting okay. cocky, but let's all do right. it. All right. Okay. Don't get penisy on me, Mike. <laughs> okay, ready? Here we go. Oh, dear. Now, you want to know which ship that came from, don't you? Nope. I just want to know what no? it is. Oh, that's a... Uh, see, now, you're not going to get me because that was not a phaser blast. That is a, tor a photon torpedo. God damn, Mike. Good job. Good I thought job. maybe, like... See, so, you now I'm sitting there going, oh, my God, is that a, uh, is that a, a photon torpedo from a uh, Cardassian or from a... Uh, no, no, that would be too know. hard. That would be ridiculous. That would be like class five. All right, Mike, uh, bet the yes. geek, who dat, or cheesies of species? Uh, let's do uh, cheesier species. All right. Ocampa. Ocampa. Did Ocampa. the Ocampa come for the accord to discuss a peace treaty between the Vulcans and the Klingons? Or did the Ocampa sit well on a nice ham sandwich? I'm going to say that they came for a peace treaty. They but, came for uh, peace treaty. Uh, yeah. Sorry, Mike. <gasps> Ooh. Ocampa. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, no, they did. I'm sorry. No, I don't know. Compass, no, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Compasses. You are right. You are right. I thought, yeah. Right. My bad. My bad. My bad. All right, Mike, you get to go again. Oh shit! All right, let me do who dat. Who dat? All right. Is this Deanna? three or four? Three. This is three. Deanna Troy. Oh my God, I'm supposed to know her real name. Yeah. 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 You're supposed uh, to know her real name. Brent Spiner. To... Brent Spiner. That's my final answer. Nice. Maybe so you Mike... should know. Right. Come on. Okay. <laughs> Ethan knows this Ooh. one. Ooh, yeah, crazy. you think? Are you looking yeah. at my screen here? I oh, am, look at I that. Yeah, yeah, there that she is. is. Nice. Yes. Yeah, that's Marina yes. Sirtis. Yeah, she's, she's a good-looking <laughs> girl. All right, you're steal, Ethan. You're go. You could pull this out. All right, out. finish me out with who dat? Who dat? Benjamin Sisko. Oh, man. That guy is super good. Um, Man. This is where this is where the brain blank comes in, and it's like, why why can I not remember the actor's name? Cause he's so good. Yeah, he played so Benson, good. right? No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Oh, no, 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 no! Don't Robert Dione me. That's terrible. Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! 
Oh man. Yeah, Ooh. I'm drawing a blank. I'm gonna have to pass oh, no. on that one. Oh no, that was Avery Brooks. It is Avery that was, Brooks. That was why it was a four pointer because everybody recognizes him. Everybody knows him, but to mm -hmm. remember his name, it's like, oh, what was his name? All right, Mike. The alt's left is bet the geek. All right, let's do it. What's the score? Oh, uh, the score is sixteen to six. I think you got this one in the bag, oh, Mike. But we're gonna go ahead. I, out, I, I, I am surprised. All right, what is the name of the Klingon homeworld? Oh shit. <laughs> It's not shit. Uh, <laughs> oh, I don't know, uh, because it was destroyed in that movie, but I forgot what the name is. Oh, no, no, that's the, um, no, in that movie, that was the Romulan homeworld. Never mind. Uh, uh, shit. Uh, uh, Uranus. <laughs> no, if only. Kronos. 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 All right, uh, Ethan, your Let's chance to get the, the last set Let's of points. Let's see here. if I can at least make a game out of it. Yes. All right, here we go. A last question, and then we'll let Ethan. We'll cut Ethan loose. We'll be almost on time. All right. What is the name of Starfleet's Black Ops division that operates separately from Starfleet Intelligence? Oh, thank God, one I know. Section thirty-one. That is. Yes, that is correct. Ooh. All right, uh, Ethan, you did you did pretty good, Mike. I, Mike, I'm shocked. I really am. I'm sorry that I sh I probably shouldn't be shocked, but I am. Mike, you get you get that. But since Ethan's got to go, I'm gonna cut you short on it. Uh, <laughs> so. Good job, everyone. <laughs> All right. Well, well, thank you. I I'm surprised that you didn't know that I was. Uh, you know, I'm a pretty decent uh, star Star Trekian. Yeah, you're more of a Star Trekian than I realized. Yeah. All right, real quick, we got to stay on schedule. Uh, let me do blah, 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 turn these scores off. Oh, wait a minute. No, wrong button. No, wrong button. God damn it! I'm hitting everything wrong. I'm hitting everything wrong. <laughs> That's what she said. Oh, this whole thing is screwed up, Mike. I got to work on this. I, I I did some editing and uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, Terry Peter. said Terry said Klingonia. <laughs> Klingonia. All right. So let's let's just uh, everybody uh, make sure you go and you check out uh, all of Ethan's stuff. I said the links before, but I'll say them again. Forbes uh, starts with a bang. SoundCloud. Ethan Siegel. Uh, Patreon starts with a bang. Starts with a bang everywhere. It, it, probably your Twitter and all that, right? It sure is. It okay. sure is. That's the best way to find me. And Ethan, thank Thanks you for having for... me here on yeah. Mythwits. It's been my pleasure. Oh, Absolutely. we love it. We love having you here. You're always, you're always good for a good mind uh, bend, uh, yes. trying to wrap our heads around this flat universe. I, I, although I and pay attention Wednesday morning because the first ever image of a black hole's event horizon is coming out. You don't want to oh, miss it. Nice. All right. The event cool. horizon telescopes big reveal Wednesday morning. Be there. And, All right, and we're gonna—we're absolutely gonna. Uh, well, shit. When your book comes out, when your when your next book comes out, make sure you let us know, and we will definitely push it as hard as we can. Sounds so, fantastic. Look for it in early 2020. Excellent. All right, here we go. All right, everybody, you've just heard another awesome episode of the Mythwits. If you don't have time for videos, make sure to subscribe via our podcast uh, on your favorite podcatcher. Do the like, follow, subscribe thing wherever it's appropriate, and make sure to share your favorite episode on social media to help spread Mythwit's love over the entire planet, or the universe in this case. You know, big, expanding, ever-expanding, inflating universe, just like Mike's, oh, uh, another, <clears throat> uh, do the like, follow, subscribe, <laughs> do like, follow, subscribe, wherever it's appropriate, to sh uh, blah, 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 sorry, I think I read that already, didn't I? Yes, I did. All right, tweet us at Mythwits and check out Mythwits.com. Mythwits is produced by Aether Forge Creations as part of the TSR Podcast Network. Check out TSRPN.com and AetherForge.com for more cool stuff. Man, Ethan had to go, I'm so, it's a shame because I got this, I got this little bit that's coming up. Mythwits is a Creative Commons product, like and share it in all the places, just don't edit it, don't sell it, and Mike, don't trade it for tribbles. You'll just have to trust me on that one. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Tell your friends to tune in. Congratulations, Mike. And until next week, Mike. Hyperbolic paraboloid. Nice.